Aaron White and Michel Boissonneau are friends who live in Vancouver's downtown east side, where their hope is to love and be loved by their neighbors. Michel, who is Métis, works as a building manager at a local church and has studied counseling. Aaron has served with the Salvation Army, 24-7 Prayer, the International Association for Refugees, and Westminster Theological Center. Most notably, these gentlemen have walked a journey of friendship and recovery. Please welcome our new friends from Vancouver, Michelle and Aaron. <laughs> Hello, strangers and friends, brothers and sisters. It's good to be here. We have already experienced on our journey, our two-day journey here from Vancouver, uh, the warm, loving, ambiguous hospitality of American Airlines um, and Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. If there are any representatives from American Airlines here today, God bless you. We're, we're being challenged to receive hospitality from our enemies, and uh, it feels like we were given the opportunity to so do that. Thank you for having us. Um, we bring you greetings from Vancouver. Vancouver is a phenomenal city. It really is beautiful. Anyone been to Vancouver? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it is, it's, it's beautiful. It's ringed with the mountains and the, the Pacific Ocean. Uh, it's incredibly wealthy. It's incredibly expensive uh, city. But we also bring you specific greetings from one particular neighborhood in Vancouver called the Downtown East Side. And this is a very strange neighborhood in Vancouver. The Downtown East Side is kind of the little neighborhood that Vancouver doesn't want to talk about. It's the place where all those other places, you know, they said there's some people who don't fit and we're going to put them all in this one socially constructed 10 by 10 block neighborhood called the Downtown East Side. And it's a very difficult place to explain. I've lived there for 21 years, and I try to explain it to people. And one of the best ways I can do that is through kind of a word picture. Um, and this happened during COVID. Uh, I was out walking, and I saw a man standing on the corner, and he had a medical mask on. And I was just watching him for a second, and he pulled his mask down and brought up his crack pipe and took a big hoot from his crack pipe and then exhaled and then put his medical mask back on. Because safety first, right? Like you, you, want, you want to be safe. That's, that is not unusual in my neighborhood at all. But here's the really strange thing about that scenario. That man believed, and possibly very correctly, that the crack that he was smoking was less dangerous to him than the epidemic that was around him. You know, he, he, he believed that. And I believe that the crack that he was smoking was actually significantly less dangerous to him and to many others than our societal response to things like an epidemic or even more, I think, uh, starkly to things like poverty and homelessness and mental health issues and addictions. I think that is the genuine epidemic in our world, the genuine killer in our world. That is incredibly dangerous. And, and I could see that, or at least, at the very least, I could say that is connected. His use of crack is connected to our societal response to those things. And, and I will say, I, I'm not going to get into, believe me, I'm not going to get into COVID here today, it's just, but, I, but I'm going to use it as an example in part because I think one of the things that that did and our response to it was it exacerbated what was already there. It made clear some of the things that already existed, the isolation that already existed, the societal fragments and fractures that already existed, and it became so apparent in our neighborhood because one of the big themes during that whole time, I don't know if you had it here, but was stay home, save lives. Did you hear that? That was the big motto in BC. Okay, well, how does that work when you have thousands and thousands of people who are homeless in a neighborhood? Stay home, save lives. What does that mean for them? Well, what that meant for them is there was no place to get clean water. What that meant for them is there was nowhere to go to the bathroom. There was nowhere to get food. There was nobody to hang out with. That's what it meant for them. Stay home, save lives. When you rely on certain services for food, bathroom, water, medical care, human contact, and community, that becomes really difficult. It took about a month before the city of Vancouver figured out, oh, we need to sort something out here. 
And so they set up a number of hand-washing stations. They set up 13 hand-washing stations, seven of which were stolen immediately, <laughs> which we were almost proud of. Like, well done, people. You're out there, you know, washing your hands somewhere. I don't know <laughs> what you're doing with that. And then they, they set up a bunch of bathrooms, little porta-potties. That was sort of what the, the city could offer. They set up these porta-potties. And I went walking around the next day, and this is uh, one of the things that we saw was uh, that. And either somebody set that on fire or they had the chili, and I'm not sure which was what. That's our neighborhood. Uh, and then... They set up these posters, and, and I thought this was really fascinating. Uh, we would all be very upset if you died from COVID-19. That was right beside the burnt down porta potty. Isn't that weird? Now here's the thing about this poster. I actually believe whoever wrote this poster. I believe them. I believe that they would be very upset. I believe that their care is genuine. And the reason I say that is I know many, many people inside the church and out who are overwhelmed by the size of the issues in our world today. And it's, just, it's incredibly stark in our neighborhood, but it's everywhere. And I believe that in their heart is this movement to care for people and to care for strangers in a really significant way. They want to do it. I believe that they would be very, very upset if people died of COVID-19. But here's the thing. This is how you care for a stranger that you kind of intend to keep as a stranger. Because the way that we care for a stranger or even maybe for a neighbor is very different from the way that we care for a friend or the way that we care for a family. And caring for a stranger is still very needed. We have to do that and we have to do that well. But it's different. And I think it's different from the call that we have as the church to care for people not just as strangers, but as friends and as family. You see, people in my neighborhood were already feeling incredibly isolated already felt like lepers. And now none of these services were open. Right underneath this sign, as we were going out, I met a man who I knew, and he was looking really awful. And I said, what's going on? And he said, well, I know that I've got three to four days to live. I don't know how he knew that, but he just knew he wasn't going to make it, or he felt he wasn't going to make it. And I said, well, what are you doing out here? He said, I'm going to try and get someplace, and I just, I just didn't want to die in my slum hotel room because I knew I'd be alone. And this is the worst thing I'd ever heard. He said, I knew that the rats would eat me. I'm sorry to say that in, an, in a stark way, but that's the reality that we're, we're living in. That wasn't about any epidemic, any viral epidemic. That was about the epidemic of loneliness. And I just want to put out there that this genuine care for the stranger in a way that cares for strangers isn't comprehensive enough. It's not strong enough medicine for the actual epidemic that we're facing in the world. And so as I'm speaking today to a group who I presume many of you are, are in the church, I want to call us to the actual medicine that we've been given, which is a much deeper, stronger, more powerful medicine that actually addresses the deep heart of the loneliness, of the disconnection in the world. So I want to speak about this issue of disconnection or dislocation. Dislocation is a word that is now being used. It's a particular term. And when we talk about hospitality and justice, we need to understand where the inhospitality and where the injustice is stemming from. And part of it is that we live in a very dislocated world. Dislocation is a term that is used to describe a lack of belonging, a lack of meaning, a lack of safety that many, many people experience in our world today. And it can be physical. People can be dislocated physically. It can be uh, psychological. 
It can be social. It can be spiritual. It involves a sense of serious disorder, injustice, confusion, hopelessness, fear. These things can be brought on by uh, events like war or terrible poverty or early childhood trauma. But this is a very defined and definable reality in our world, displacement. Does it sound familiar at all? When you think about the world that you're living in right now, does it sound like it might be a little dislocated? And we could give lots of different examples that the, the mass dislocation that we're living through as individuals, as families, as communities, cities, countries, and, and they're devastating the way that they affect us. Lots of examples we could give. I'm going to stay away from politics because, my goodness, <laughs> we're not going to talk about that. I want to talk, touch on something slightly less toxic than your politics, and that's the opioid crisis. <laughs> it's a bit of a cheap shot, I'm sorry, but it's... <laughs> let's talk about the opioid crisis just a little bit. And my friend Michelle and I are going to talk about that more in a seminar, but uh, someone who's from Vancouver, Dr. Bruce K. Alexander, he wrote The Dislocation Theory of Addictions, which suggests that a major factor in addictions is the disconnection that people experience within a dislocated society. We know that the more dislocated a society is, whether it's from tyranny, whether it's from war, whether it's from massive social inequalities, the more addictions we see. We know this, we can chart this historically. And right now in the world, you may have heard of the fentanyl crisis. People familiar with that, the fentanyl crisis? 60 million people worldwide are affected by the fentanyl crisis. 100,000 people every year die of overdose to fentanyl. And we tend to think that that may happen in certain places. Certainly in my neighborhood, it does happen a lot. But I looked up the numbers. In 2022, there was 1,421 opioid deaths in Wisconsin. That's the last year that we have reliable numbers. And when we see those numbers, when we hear those numbers, it's very easy to view people as just one more statistic in an overwhelming problem. And so then we have to go, well, we would be very upset if you died from the opioid crisis. We'll put up posters and maybe we'll have some shelters and maybe we'll try and give out some food and we want to care for people. And that care is genuine and it's needed. It needs to happen. But is it enough? And here's the answer. We know that it isn't. We know that it's not because lots of good people, many of you probably in the room right now, are doing lots of good things from a very deep well of care and love for strangers, and people are still dying six a day in my neighborhood. We've had six people die touching my house in the last couple of years. We know it's not sufficient. It's not enough. The medicine doesn't seem to be strong enough. But if we believe, if we have faith that there's a God who has made us for something, then maybe there is strong enough medicine there somewhere, yeah? Do we have hope for that? Is it possible? Here's the thing. When I was invited to come and speak on this, I wasn't sure I wanted to come. I'm not sure, because I don't love conferences, quite frankly. I, I don't. I, this seems cool. You all seem really neat. But I'm like, but I come because I go, I, I actually believe that there's something that's in us, that God has put in us. But here's that. But I won't put up with us just kind of getting around and talking about stuff. Because it's just, it's not good enough. People are literally dying. And not just of fentanyl. We are dying of loneliness. There's an epidemic of just the disastrous proportions of disconnection and dislocation in our world. And the church is supposed to be the depository of this incredible power of love. I mean, we can call it hospitality. That should be something. That should be heaven's answer to what's going on in the world. And we just don't seem to be applying the medicine strongly enough for whatever reason. I include myself in that statement. The stats tell a frightening story. In 2016, a, a public health emergency was declared in British Columbia, but those of us on the ground knew that something was up because we started missing people. When we were working in, in the recovery centers, people would go out and they would not come back. We knew something was going on. And addictions is a very, very complicated issue. We're gonna talk about it m more, as I said. But if it's true that dislocation is a source of things like addiction, and not just to drugs and alcohol, but all kinds of things. Maybe, what was the big addiction during COVID? What was the thing that you kind of defaulted to? Anybody? You don't have to, speed! You know, like you just... <laughs> Netflix. 
Netflix. Anybody said, oh, I'm just going to binge Netflix? Since when did binge become a really good word? <laughs> binge suggests like you've got a problem, you know, if you're binging. I think Amazon, I think Amazon is the middle class crack. That's what I think it is. You press the button and you get the, ooh, you get the reward. Like, oh, make it come quicker. Like that's, that's what, I think that's what it is. It's, it's the same pleasure center reward stuff. If dislocation, if our sense of, well, I can't talk to people, so I need to buy stuff like that. If I'm feeling bored, I need to go eat something. That's, that's attachment. That's addiction. This is a, a level of disconnection and dislocation. If that's real and if that's affecting everybody, and I guarantee you it is, then location could be a significant part of the answer, don't you think? If dislocation is a big part of the problem, then maybe location is a big part of the answer. The opposite of addiction, they say now in recovery circles, is not sobriety. It's connection. It's not sobriety because you can find people who just kind of become sober and they're still miserable. And you go, maybe you should take a drink. You know, like it's just seriously because they're just really, really miserable. They haven't gotten it. But there's a, there's a, a level of connection that is in the most beautiful treatment scenarios, but also in the most beautiful churches, the most beautiful communities that actually cause us to live in the way we were made to live. Connection is what we're looking for. And helping one another experience location, connection, to feel like we belong, to feel like we have meaning, to feel safe, is another way of talking about hospitality. And it's not putting on nice dinner parties. That can be part of it. I like a good dinner party. But if that's what we think of as hospitality, we've missed the boat. It's not strong enough medicine. It's a Band-Aid. It's not a cure. So churches and social services can provide essential resources, absolutely, towards helping alleviate displacement. And we need it. And we need it to be done well. But here's the question. Are systems and programs enough? Because systems and programs is still an approach that views people as strangers and sort of has to keep them in that place. Maybe at best, we might view them as neighbors. It's a starting point, but it's not enough. And I get asked to go around and speak a lot about what does it mean to be good neighbors. And I'll tell you this. If people heard that churches were asking teachers to come in and tell them what it means to be a good neighbor, if people outside the churches heard that, they'd be going, what are you talking about? It's a weird thing to be asked to do. I, I'll, I'll be honest. It's a weird thing to come and explain to people what it means to be a good neighbor. And I'm like, well, I don't know. I'll try and figure it out. Like, Who's your neighbor? Do you know your neighbor? Like, let's start. Do you know your neighbor's name? Most of the churches I talk to do not. They don't know the names of their neighbors. Okay, let's start there. But a lot of what the churches are asking for is, well, what is the right program to institute to become good neighbors? And they are moved to offer soup kitchens and food hampers and out-of-the-cold shelters. And this is not a wrong motivation. This is a good motivation. And all those things are evidence of being kind to strangers and being a good neighbor. But I'm not convinced that the call on the church is just to be good neighbors who offer the best programs. I think we have a much higher destiny and a much higher and greater and deeper responsibility than that. And I think we ought to take that seriously. I'll give you an example. This is way back in the 4th century, 4th, 5th century when the church suddenly became the power in the land in the Roman Empire. Before that, they had kind of been persecuted and, and, and getting by in various ways, but then suddenly they became the power of the empire. And one of the things that the empire did was it said, we will provide funds for houses of hospice, hospitality. And they created these hosp hospitality houses where people would come, strangers could come, visitors could come, travelers could come, and they could stay. And one bishop was furious about this. And he just fought it and fought it as hard as he could. He said, no, you must not fund these houses of hospitality. And people didn't understand why he was so upset about this. And he said, the reason I'm so upset about this is before this, every single Christian household expected as their duty and their privilege to have an extra room with an extra bed, with an extra thing of water and, and extra bread. So that anyone who came to their door, they would be excited to bring them in and offer hospitality. They said, now you have created a scenario where if anyone comes to the door, they will say, go down the street to the church-run, state-sponsored house of hospitality. Is a house of hospitality a wrong impulse? No, of course not. But what does it take from the actual household of faith when we think that's somebody else's job? Can we be honest for a second? Isn't that kind of where we've got to? It's someone else's job. I remember a pastor once saying to me, it's really frustrating on a Sunday. Someone comes to my church and, you know, they need help. And I call all the services and I can't find any place to give them food. And I said, what? 
He said, they've, they've, they've come to your church and they've asked for food and you're, you can't find anywhere to give them food. And he realized what I was on about. He goes, oh, maybe I'll just send them to your house, okay? And I'm like, well, okay, okay, if you want. But I think you, don't you eat on a Sunday? Right? But it's just that like, we, we've, it's, I'm not saying he's a bad guy. He's a really good guy. But it just, it, it's that switch of imagination that, oh, I know who helps people and it's not us. There's an official way that we do this. Friends, that's actually not hospitality. That's a hospitality industry. Right? And it can be done well or it can be done badly. American Airlines, calling you out. <laughs> but I think we're called to something better, something much deeper. When I think of dislocation, I think of probably my favorite book in the Bible, actually, the book of Ruth. I don't know if you've engaged much with the book of Ruth. That is a fantastic book. Oh, I love it. Four chapters long. Read it tonight if you can. Uh, it is a book that begins in dislocation. In the days when the judges ruled. So it's a strange book, Ruth. Because it's a tiny story. It's a small story that's nestled in the midst of big stories. Like the book of Judges. Anyone read the book of Judges recently? That is a humdinger of a book, that one. <laughs> Whew. I, my, my wife and I, we, read, we took a season and read the book of Judges to our children, because that's a normal thing to do. And um, they were fascinated. They were like, whoa, wow. And then they were scandalized. And then they were horrified when we got to Judges 19 with this story of this Levite and the concubine. I'm not even going to get into all of that. But like how they come to this city and they are treated with the most Im like imaginable inhospitality and injustice where the whole village comes together and says, well, we're going to sexually assault you. And it turns out that it's the concubine who pays the serious you know, brunt of that and ends up being killed. And then her body with indignity is taken and used to create war. I mean, it could not be worse. <laughs> My children just eyes like the size of soup plates. What are you reading to us, Father? You know, what is going on? So in the days when the judges ruled, this is the context for the story. And if you wanted to talk about justice and injustice, you think, well, go to Judges or go to Kings or go to Samuel or Chronicles, these big stories. But Ruth is a tiny story that's weird. It's, every bit of it is weird because the focus of the story isn't even an Israelite. It's not a man. It's a woman who's not even part of the people of God. She's a Moabite. It's so weird. In the days when the judges ruled, there was famine in the land. There is dislocation. There should not be famine in the land, but there is dislocation. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He leaves. He's physically dislocated with his family. He and his wife and his two sons, they become uh, migrants. They have to leave. They have to get across the wall, you know, all that stuff. And they have to go to Moab. And they're, they're totally dislocated. This is not a good scenario. It starts bad. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. The names of his two sons were Mathlon and Chilion, and they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. And it gets worse because Elimelech dies and leaves Naomi a widow. And then Mahlon and Chilion die and leave their wives widows. And Naomi, later on, she says she's so distraught and destroyed and dislocated by this that she says, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, which means bitterness. She is in a place of serious dislocation, physical and emotional and spiritual. And she says to her two daughters-in-law, leave. I don't have anything more to give to you. And one of them does. But Ruth says, no, I will go with you. And they come back to uh, Judah. They come back to Bethlehem. And, but the, the dislocation doesn't stop. It carries on. Because we see these moments where Naomi says, okay, you have to go out into the field. We have, we're starving. You have to get food. But be careful. Be careful as you go out into the food. And when she interacts later with Boaz, Boaz says, okay, I'll make sure that my men, I'll instruct them not to touch you. Have you ever caught that part of the story and thought that, oh, wait a minute. What's going on? We read Ruth to our kids as well. And I said, now, why would he have to say that? And my youngest, one of my youngest son went, oh, because of Judges 19. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly why he put it together. This is what's going on in our world still to this day in our neighborhood. This kind of thing still happens. So there's this dislocation happening in the book of Judges. It's not how it's supposed to be. And Boaz, this character, he is called a kinsman redeemer. And we now would say, yeah, he's a type of Christ. And he sees Ruth, a stranger. He's heard of her, but she's a stranger. And he offers her, what? Protection. And he offers her food, right? So there's a starting point, the place where you meet a stranger. 
He offers her these things, but he doesn't stop there. He's not satisfied just by saying, I'll make sure the men don't touch you and that you have enough food for tonight. That's how you care for a stranger. But Boaz doesn't stop there. He moves on from there. He cares for her. He protects her. He welcomes her. He advocates for her. He sacrifices for her. He redeems her. He becomes family to her. Both Boaz sees Ruth as unique. She is loved and wanted. He doesn't see Ruth as just another Moabitess or as just another problem. And I don't know how many of us in the room here will have a deep experience of just being felt like I'm just another, per, another number or a problem. There will be some who are in the room who feel like that. And I do know, I want to bring up my friend, Michelle. Michelle, would you come up with me now? Michelle and I have been friends for the last 10 years. And, and what I really want to try and get at, uh, Michelle, is how is it that we, be, we moved from stranger? Uh, we've been traveling for the last two days together, so we are very familiar with each other even more than we were before. Um, how is it that we move from being strangers to being friends to being, dare I say, uh, family? How is it that we met, first of all? Right. So um, I, um, I'm Michelle. I'm, um, I, I love beer. So um, <laughs> throughout my life to everything, I, I got into um, uh, drinking lots of beer. And that finally caught up with me. I managed to become a journeyman electrician. I managed to almost become married twice. I, Got it all the way to the age of 45, and it finally caught up with me, and so I went into treatment. That's where I met Aaron. And then um, I grew up a Roman Catholic, but um, the kind that uh, celebrate Christmas, Easter, and we do our birthdays, and this is back in the day in uh, Labrador City, Newfoundland. So there we had a channel called the CBC. So whatever was shown on the CBC, that was the only one Sometimes there would be shows about Jesus Christ, and that's, you know, where I would read about Jesus Christ. And, and also, my father would read to us the Bible the odd time, so I knew of Jesus Christ and God. So that was it that got me all the way through to 39-ish, 44. Then I decided to go into treatment, and I met Aaron. In my first day of treatment, I learned that there was a church right across the street. Oh, good Lord. Such as it is. Excuse me. Such as it is. And um, Aaron was preaching there, so I wanted to go to church every Sunday, like a good Christian, while I was renewing my life with, uh, you know, not drinking, everything. So I did that. And over time, um, I got to know Aaron and his family a little bit more. I sat down at first like a quiet, obedient person, and then not even a Bible at first, and then eventually I opened the Bible and I started to listen. And with what I knew of Jesus Christ, I kind of put the pieces together. And uh, so that's how I got to know Aaron. And um, am I getting anywhere near the right place here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what's interesting, because you know, we, we've known each other for 10 years, and so I know the story well. But, you know, it's difficult when you're feeling like you're on the outside looking in. Do you think that's how a lot of people feel, even around the, a church center, even a welcoming church? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wondered why other people in the treatment center were not going to church every Sunday. I mean, there's nothing else to do. You can't drink. So and smoking's frowned upon and that kind of thing. Maybe they'll go to church. I mean, I'm surprised that not more people went over there. There was like three or four out of yep. 150. And um, so it gave me something to do. And carry on <laughs> one more time, sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, how does it feel like being... On the outside, looking in, how does it feel right. like, you know, I, I'm sort of welcomed or people are friendly to me, but I don't feel like I'm necessarily part of this. Right. So there's, um, it was kind of a journey. So I sat down and then people left me alone. I really liked that while I sorted my affairs for the first few Sundays. And then what happened was that when you become, when I became more familiar in the church, people came up and they said, hello, welcome. Hello, welcome. Hello, welcome. And so I reciprocated, hello, welcome. And then as I listened more to Aaron, I became more curious, uh, and, and whoever was speaker, because Aaron's very generous with the podium, I became more curious about what, was, uh, what, what it was in the Bible and that kind of thing. As I became more familiar in that church, people started to say, hello, Michelle, welcome, Michelle, and that kind of thing. And then over time again, would you, you know, man the front door and greet people? And I got to that position. And not that there's positions so much as uh, the hierarchical structure of my Roman Catholic, <laughs> Catholic bringing, but uh, 
but it, it, became, it was very, very friendly and warm. And so that's how I got to know both Aaron, the community, myself too, you know, like what is this thing without drinking? And then, oh, okay, there's a whole world. And, uh, and that helped me to understand the interplay of human connections and that kind of thing. So did uh, going to college and that kind of stuff, but yeah. 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 Well, and, and then everything from 10 years ago when we first met to now has gone perfect and there's never been any hiccups and... Yeah, yeah that's right? what I love about yeah. this life. <laughs> so, we've been, so we've been through some stuff and, um, and I kind of want to, so I want to get into that just a little bit if you're comfortable with that. Just yeah. how is it that we went from even just being strangers to being, well, we're friends or we're in the same church or there's that weird kind of dynamic of this is the pastor and I'm part of the church to how is it that we became... Really, and I, I would say, you know, friends, even like brothers. How does, where, where do you think that came from? There's a connection that was born definitely with uh, seeing Aaron preaching every Sunday. And then there, he'd do another thing too. He'd come into the treatment center, I think it was Thursdays, and for about an hour, he'd play piano and he would uh, preach to everybody in treatment. Certainly there was a thing where you had to in the first two months of being in that building that you had to come to these meetings and you had to listen to Aaron preach. So going to church <laughs> and hearing Aaron there, yeah, it wasn't bad. <laughs> it, it was, uh, I, I got to know him a little bit more that way. And so I was curious, I, you know, I'd ask him, I'd walk up to him and I'd say, what about this in the Bible? What about this? What about that? Because I knew it all. And so I just had to make sure he did too. Mm -hmm. And then, um, <laughs> and uh, so then I, 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 I got more comfortable with Aaron, always polite, always kind. And then I'd see him walking to his house some four blocks away after church, and I'd walk with him because I had more questions. What about this? What about that in the Bible? And then eventually, um, even after the program ended after a year, even before then, I was invited over to, for supper to Aaron's house. And it, uh, you know, nervous at first and everything, going to a preacher's house for, for, for lunch. And then, mm. and then um, a sinner like I, it was partly in my mind, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> So then that became more calm, more relaxed, and then the friendship developed further and further and further from there where we eventually traveled the world, and um, yeah, um, and I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And Thanks. And the thing, the, what I really do want to bring out is that sometimes when even these kind of stories get presented, it can feel like... Uh, you know, there's, there's one person sort of reaching out and the other person receiving. But actually the beauty of this relationship, and it's become very apparent even recently, is that there's a mutual blessing in it. To be a friend with someone, to be family with somebody, is not the same as just caring for a stranger. There's a, there's a mutuality, there's a reception of blessing. And, and I, again, my family's been going through some serious struggles recently and I shared with Michelle and just said, like, I, given all these struggles, I'm not even sure if we should go. And what Michelle said to me, so graciously was, no, all the more we should go. Mm. All the more we should go together and, and, and talk. And, and what you did with me, Michelle, is in a place where I was feeling incredibly dislocated, you relocated me with your grace and your kindness and your love to me. And, and it's the reason why I say I won't go and I won't do things without you or without other friends, because I think we have to model a different way of being. That isn't just you know, one person speaking from the front or any of that kind of stuff. We actually have to show that friendship means you support me and I support you. And, and when I look at the book of Ruth, I see that. You know, Boaz, we sometimes think Boaz is the hero in the story. Actually, he's not. Ruth is the hero in the story. She's the one who, when Naomi is in this place of total bitterness, she says, I will go with you. My people, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. She locates Naomi with her love. That's when Boaz meets her. He goes, I've heard about what you've done. And then later when, when she comes to him on the, the threshing room floor, he says, you have been more kind to me than, than anybody else. He receives her as kindness. And there's this incredible moment where, where he wants to redeem her, but there's a closer relative who's allowed. And they go, they go to the gates of the city. And we won't have time to go through it all, I don't think. But um, they went to, uh, oh, we'll go here. He goes and he, he talks to this other person and says, do you want to take the land? And he goes, yeah, I want the land. He says, well, if you want to take the land, then you have to take Ruth too. And he goes, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to take Ruth too because that's going to cost me. There's a cost to hospitality. And because he only saw Ruth as a burden. He saw Ruth as a problem. He says, I do not wish to take her. And here's from Deuteronomy 25. I love this. Then his brother's wife, if someone says, I won't take that person, 
he won't do the duty. He says, then his brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. Not COVID friendly. (laughs) And she shall answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. And the name of his house shall be called in Israel, the house of him who had his sandal pulled off. Did you know that? Deuteronomy 25, 7 to 10. Use it as a life verse. This is a really good one. If you will not take care of vulnerable women, you should be spat in the face and have you hit with a sandal and be called the person with the sandal pulled off. That's the law. But does Boaz do that? Does Ruth do that at the end of Ruth? No. They don't do that. Why? Because Boaz is thrilled. Boaz is overjoyed that he gets Ruth. And I think this is the starting point of our hospitality as we change our perspective from people are burdens to bear or problems to fix to people are gifts to receive. And this is how Jesus views us. Think about it. Think about the number of times that Jesus received blessing from people in the scriptures, from very unlikely people. And think about that really strange verse, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. What was the joy? It was the joy of friendship. The joy of friendship with us. When Jesus says to his disciples, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. There is a mutuality there. This is the model we are given by Jesus. This is what his hospitality looks like to us. That he welcomes us as friends. It is different than the care given to a stranger. The friendship that I have with Michelle is a mutuality that is different than the care that I might give to a stranger. And in part because it is hugely blessing back to me. That's not selfish, that's what we're made for. We're made for that level of friendship and family. And I'll just end with this one last story, it's one of my favorite stories. It's our friend Stan. Stan is a man who was called the heroin kingpin of the downtown east side, very dangerous dude, in and out of prison more often than just about anybody else, but got to a point where his life was just destroyed. He tried to end his life, didn't work, and he found himself walking through the streets of wet Vancouver without any shoes. He was just walking through the alleys, walking through the streets, just in misery. And somebody who was at a shelter saw him and knew his name and said, Stan, why don't you come in and get some shoes? And Stan says, that changed my life. I don't think because of the shoes. I think because someone knew his name and said, come on in. And Stan came in and his life has changed and now he runs four recovery houses and the police cannot believe it because they know this guy. But he is the most welcoming person imaginable. And it's not a program. He actually brings people in and he saves people's lives. That is the power of hospitality. That is the power of location in our world. And it is the power of family and friendship. It is not just the power of caring for strangers. But that's where it can begin. But it has to go much deeper. Friends, can we go deeper in that place? Amen? Amen. Thanks. Thanks.